It all started as a joke, or at least that's how Mark presented it to me. Oh, you know how it is, he'd say with a laugh, Anna's like my work wife. I remember the first time he said it ah he was standing in the kitchen, pouring himself a cup of coffee before heading out the door. I didn't think much of it then. We were comfortable in our marriage, or so I thought. Seven years together, a beautiful little girl, and a life that, by all outward appearances, was solid and happy. But something changed. I can't pinpoint exactly when, but over time, Mark became more and more preoccupied with work. I suppose that's how it happens. You don't notice the small things, the gradual shifts, until one day, you realize that the man sitting across from you at the dinner table is a stranger. I noticed it in the way he was always on his phone, smiling at text messages that weren't meant for me. I noticed it in the way he started coming home later and later, with vague excuses about meetings running over or needing to stay late to finish a project. And of course, Anna was always there Anna from work, Anna the work wife. I used to trust him, used to believe that our love was something unshakable, something that could withstand anything. But that trust began to erode, bit by bit, like the slow, relentless chipping away of a stone by water. I would lie awake at night, staring at the ceiling, wondering what he was doing when he was supposed to be at work. Wondering if the work wife had become something more. It wasn't just his late nights that worried me. It was the way he looked at me or rather, the way he didn't. He used to look at me with such love, such warmth, but now his eyes seemed to pass right through me, like I wasn't even there. He stopped touching me stopped kissing me the way he used to. Even when we were intimate, it felt mechanical, like he was just going through the motions. I felt like a ghost in my own marriage, unseen and unheard. I tried to convince myself that it was all in my head, that I was overreacting. After all, we were both busy. We had a child, and that takes a toll on any relationship. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. I could feel it in my bones, in the pit of my stomach. I knew it, but I wasn't ready to face it. I began to notice the little things a Mark's shirt smelling faintly of a perfume that wasn't mine, his laughter becoming more frequent but never shared with me, the way he would always mention Anna in passing, as if to normalize her constant presence in his life. I even found myself casually asking him about her, trying to gauge his reaction but he would always brush it off, saying she was just a friend, just a co-worker. You're being silly, he'd say with a chuckle. But it didn't feel silly. It felt like my world was slowly unraveling. I tried to push the thoughts out of my mind, to focus on our daughter, on my work, on anything that would keep me from spiraling into the abyss of doubt. But the more I tried to ignore it, the more it consumed me. I became obsessed checking his phone when he was in the shower, scrolling through his social media accounts for any sign, any hint of what I feared most. But Mark was careful. He had always been good at covering his tracks. Then, one evening, everything came crashing down. It was a Friday night, and Mark had promised to be home early so we could have a family dinner. Our daughter was excited as she had drawn a picture at school that she couldn't wait to show him. But as the hours ticked by, and the food grew cold on the table, I knew he wasn't coming. I called his phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Panic set in. I called the office, but no one answered. Finally, I did something I never thought I would do I drove to his office. The building was dark, save for a few lights on the upper floors. My heart pounded in my chest as I parked the car and made my way inside. I didn't know what I was expecting to find, but the knot in my stomach told me it wasn't good. I took the elevator to his floor, my hands shaking as I pressed the button. When the doors opened, I stepped out into the dimly lit hallway, the sound of my footsteps echoing off the walls. I approached his office, the door slightly ajar, and I could hear voices a Mark's voice, and a woman's voice, laughing softly. My breath caught in my throat as I pushed the door open, and there they were. Mark was sitting on the edge of his desk, 
and Anna was standing in front of him, her hand on his arm, her body too close to his for it to be innocent. They both froze when they saw me, and for a moment, the room was silent. Then Anna stepped back, her face flushed with embarrassment, while Mark stared at me, his eyes wide with guilt. It's not what it looks like, he stammered, but the words felt hollow, empty. I didn't say anything. I couldn't. I just turned and walked out, my legs trembling, my heart shattering into a million pieces. I don't remember how I got home, but when I did, I locked myself in the bathroom and sobbed. The betrayal cut deep, deeper than I ever thought possible. It wasn't just that he had been unfaithful or it was the lies, the deceit, the way he had made me feel like I was the crazy one, like I was imagining things. He didn't come home that night. I didn't expect him to. The next morning, he finally walked through the door, looking haggard and ashamed. He tried to explain, to apologize, but his words fell on deaf ears. I was numb, the pain too overwhelming to process. I told him to leave, and he did, without protest. He knew what he had done, and he knew there was no fixing it. The weeks that followed were a blur. I filed for divorce, and Mark moved out. Our daughter was confused, hurt, but I did my best to protect her, to shield her from the ugliness of it all. I didn't tell her that rather she was too young to understand. I just told her that mummy and daddy needed some time apart. It was hard, so incredibly hard, to wake up every day and face the reality of what my life had become. I had lost not just my husband, but the future I had envisioned, the family I had worked so hard to build. But as time passed, something shifted. The pain began to lessen, and in its place, a new feeling emerged to anger. Anger at Mark for what he had done but also anger at myself for allowing it to happen, for not standing up for myself sooner. That anger fueled me. It gave me the strength to pick up the pieces of my shattered life and start over. I threw myself into my work, into being the best mother I could be, and slowly, I began to rebuild. I started going to the gym, taking better care of myself, and I even began seeing a therapist who helped me work through the emotions I had buried deep inside. Six months passed, and I was a different persona stronger, more confident, more aware of my own worth. I had moved on from Mark, but I knew he hadn't moved on from me. He would call occasionally, asking how I was, how our daughter was, always trying to gauge if there was any chance of reconciliation. But I kept my distance, kept the conversations brief and to the point. I wasn't ready to forgive him, and I wasn't sure I ever would be. Then one day, out of the blue, Mark showed up at my door. He looked different to thinner, more worn, like the weight of his actions had finally caught up with him. He asked if we could talk, and for some reason, I agreed. We sat down in the living room, the silence heavy between us. I miss you, he said finally his voice thick with emotion. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but I can't stop thinking about you, about us. I made a terrible mistake, and I would do anything to make it right. I looked at him, the man I had once loved more than anything, and I felt a pang of sadness. But it wasn't the kind of sadness that made me want to take him back it was the sadness of realizing that what we had was gone, and it wasn't coming back. You can't make it right, Mark, I said softly. What you did destroyed our marriage, and I don't think I can ever trust you again. He looked down, his hands trembling. I know, he whispered. I know I messed up, but I can't let go of the hope that maybe, someday, we could find a way back to each other. I shook my head. I've moved on, Mark. I've found a new sense of who I am and I'm not willing to sacrifice that for a relationship that was built on lies. You need to move on too. He looked up at me, his eyes filled with regret. I don't know how to, he admitted. You were everything to me, and I threw it all away for something that meant nothing. I sighed, feeling a mixture of pity and frustration. You need to figure that out on your own, Mark. I can't help you with that. 
But I can tell you these are you need to take responsibility for your actions and learn from them. If you don't, you'll never find peace. He nodded, his shoulders slumped in defeat. I'm sorry, he said again, but this time, the words felt more genuine, more real. I know you are, I replied. But it's too late for us. With that, Mark left, and I felt a strange sense of closure. It wasn't the ending I had hoped for, but it was an ending nonetheless. I had faced the man who had betrayed me, and I had walked away with my head held high. The following months were a time of growth and healing. I focused on my daughter, on my career, and on building a life that was mine and mine alone. I learned to trust myself again, to listen to my instincts, and to never settle for anything less than I deserved. Then, one day, I got a call that would change everything. It was Mark, and he sounded different to karma, more centered. He told me that he had been seeing a therapist, that he had been working on himself, trying to understand why he had done what he did. He said he had come to realize that his actions had nothing to do with me, and everything to do with his own insecurities and fears. I know I can't undo the past, he said, but I want you to know that I'm truly sorry. I've been working on being a better person and I hope that, one day, you can forgive me. I was taken aback by his honesty, by the sincerity in his voice. It was the first time I had heard him take full responsibility for his actions, without trying to make excuses or deflect blame. I appreciate that, Mark, I said. I really do. And while I don't know if I can ever fully forgive you, I'm glad to hear that you're working on yourself. That's important. He paused for a moment, then said something that completely caught me off guard. I know this might sound crazy, but I've been thinking a lot about us, about everything that happened. And I realize now that I was never truly happy with myself, which is why I looked for validation elsewhere. But I've changed, and I've realized that you're the only person I've ever really loved. I know I don't deserve a second chance, but if you could ever see it in your heart to try again, I promise I would do everything in my power to make it work. I was silent, processing his words. A part of me was tempted, drawn to the idea of rekindling what we once had. But another part of me, the part that had been broken and rebuilt, knew that going back would mean sacrificing the new person I had become. I don't know, Mark, I said finally. A lot has happened, and I'm not the same person I was before. I've built a new life, and I'm not sure I want to go back to the old one. I understand, he replied, his voice tinged with sadness. I just wanted you to know that I'm here, and that I'll always be here, if you ever change your mind. After that conversation, I spent a lot of time thinking, reflecting on everything that had happened, and on who I had become. I realized that while Mark's betrayal had shattered me, it had also forced me to confront parts of myself that I had been ignoring. It had made me stronger, more resilient, more self-aware. One day, a few weeks after our conversation, I made a decision. I called Mark and asked him to meet me for coffee. When we sat down, I could see the hope in his eyes, the anticipation. But I had made up my mind. Mark, I began, I've thought a lot about what you said and I appreciate your honesty. I really do. But I've come to realize that I can't go back. Our relationship, as much as it meant to me, is in the past. I've moved on, and I'm happy with the person I've become. I'm not willing to sacrifice that to try and fix something that's broken. He looked devastated, but he nodded, understanding. I get it, he said quietly. I'm just glad you're happy. I am, I said with a smile. And I want you to be happy too, Mark. I want you to find peace, to move on and build a life that makes you happy. We parted ways that day, and for the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of peace. I had faced my past, and I had chosen my future. It wasn't the fairy tale ending I had once imagined, but it was real, and it was mine. Six months later, I ran into Mark again, this time by chance at a mutual friend's party. He was there with someone new or a woman who seemed kind, genuine, 
and good for him. We exchanged pleasantries, and I could see that he was in a better place, that he had found a way to move on, just as I had. As I left the party that night, I felt a sense of closure, of finality. My life had taken a different path than I had expected, but it was a path that I had chosen for myself. I had faced the pain, the betrayal, and I had come out the other side stronger, more resilient, and more sure of who I was. In the end, the shock of his life wasn't some grand gesture or act of revenge. It was simply me choosing myself, choosing my own happiness over trying to fix something that was irreparably broken. And that, I realized, was the greatest victory of all.